Hi guys and welcome, I'm Enigmius and today a little bit of this, a little bit of that, all towards the nether crawler. But to start off, we're actually underwater, we're in the overworld test hangar, testing things. That's half the fun of doing these builds is testing things and learning about new things and uh, I just smashed my monitor and had to put it back. Let's put it facing the right direction. That's uh so I may have mentioned in the last episode that we we're gonna be using computer craft to do the navigation control and such in the nether crawler. I was a mistake and I actually should have said uh red power computers. This is what I've got here. I've got the monitor, the disk drive, the CPU, and the IO expander. Here I've got rainbow. I thought it was rainbow barf, but then I learned that it's coming out the back of the IO expander, so I don't really want to know what it is. All I know is it's all over the floor. And we've got all the different possible colors of insulated redstone alloy wire hooked up to a row of lamps. You can see two of those lamps are on and the rest are off. And I was basically, see, I had a choice, although I didn't even think about it at the time. I could have looked in the wiki to find out what colors of wires are associated with what values in the red, the red power computers. Or I could just line up a bunch of lamps and wires and test it for myself until I got it figured out, which is what I did. And I actually, call me silly, I had fun doing it, but now um, I've got this here because it's a great way to test if I'm doing a particular little chunk of code. I can test it on the lamps and see how they respond before I start hooking it up to motors and other contraptions where having things go haywire could mean stuff jammed into glass ceilings or pushed through floors or whatever. So. That's what I've done. Over here, I've got another red power computer set up. This is the one that will eventually find its way to the nether crawler. Um, and this is actually a fully functioning sled of sorts. You can see it's all frames. It's above the floor. And right now, it's only set up to move two directions. That way and that way. And that's because I don't need to test anymore in terms of the motor function. If those motors are working properly, then as far as changing it so that it would go you know, north or south or up or down, it's just changing the numbers in the words for the program itself. So I'm not too concerned about having all the motors, but this is also a great opportunity if you haven't seen a worm drive in action before for you to be able to take a look at it in repeated action because of the way the program is working. Now I've set up sort of a fueling dock of sorts here. You can see I've got the blue cables for the blue alloy wire um, and it goes all the way around to the other side. So when I get into the proper position, which I'll do right now, it automatically reconnects the wires and charges the batteries for me so that this thing stays fully autonomous. It's not, you know, strung to the cables as I'm moving around. So let's just take a moment and show you how it goes backwards. Now these are the little chunks of code that I work. Ignore this one in the middle here because I did it wrong. <laughs> you see forget east and then I redid it. I did it right with the proper number assigned to the color of the wire that I wanted to use and then I've just been going back and forth with it to kind of get a feel for how it was going to work which works well. So if I want to move back so that it's lined up properly with the cables I would do one blocks exclamation point east and then, see, before I could even turn around, it was done. But you see the cables are connected again, connected on this side to the batteries. So if these batteries weren't already full, they would be receiving charge from the thermopile batteries down below. So that was one convenient sort of aspect of it. But then, I mean, that's not very fun. Let's head, let's do seven blocks in that direction, just so that I have time to turn around and you'll get a chance to see what the motors look like when they're inching along, thus the, the name inchworm drive. So seven blocks west and we back out and you can see the signal goes to the bottom motor which sends the top motor onto this frame and then the redstone signal from this black cable signals that motor to push and it pushes everything attached to that frame which happens to include the sled we're standing on in that direction. So we ended up seven blocks from where we started. We were connected to the cables and now we're over here. So that's the basics of the inchworm drive and it's also giving you an idea of how the computer control is going to work. I'm hoping to refine the code a little bit so it's not quite so computer-like when you're you know telling it which direction to go and how far but you know plenty of time for that. The, re the whole idea of having it here is that I can plug away at this without having to worry about what's going on with the, the structure of the nether crawler because having to move it around and worry about cables and get everything connected right now would be a bit of 
a pain in the butt. So there's one other thing that I wanted to show you that will make more sense later on. Actually, it's already started to make sense, but just so that we're clear from the beginning why I've made certain decisions. You see, I've got, uh, I'll just take one of these. Ah, here we go. One pneumatic tube and uh, not the iron. Let's take a cobblestone. One cobblestone transport pipe. So we've got one tube. Now you can see it's attached to the frame. If we look off to this side, it's really difficult to see because of the frames behind it, but it looks like it's not actually attached to the frame, but it is. It's directly adjacent to it, so it counts as attached. Same thing with the cobblestone. And another thing to notice is because they're side by side, the pneumatic tube shows this graphic that suggests if it was able to connect to that tube or the pipe, it would. It can't, but you can still see the graphic indicating there's something there that it would like to try and connect to. All right. So now if we move, let's go, uh, we might as well go east, but we don't need to go the full three blocks. Sorry, seven blocks, but we'll go three just for, for kicks. Now you see the cobblestone pipe has disappeared. It's turning into a box. <laughs> That's a swoon. Did you guys, let's try that again. Let's move the other four blocks and see if it does it again. Yeah, it turns into a box. Instead of, there's, <laughs> it's glitchy. It's glitchy and that's exactly what I'm trying to illustrate to you. I never noticed the box thing before, but you can see I don't know how well it'll show up in the final video, but on my screen right now, I can clearly see the black framed outline of where the cobblestone pipe should be. Just that little cube that was the cobblestone pipe. The game recognizes that something of that size is still there, but it's not displaying it. And also the pneumatic pipe still has these little bits here trying to connect to something. But if I take anything and break it, there's, there's nothing. See, I don't, there's no pipe to pick up. And I've tested this repeatedly. It's not like it's just off somewhere off to the side or something where I'm not grabbing it. I've done this a few times already and there's never anything for me to pick up. So we saw it turn into a box. We saw it disappear and we saw nothing for us to grab when we broke it off, which tells me too glitchy to count on. And I actually, in some of my earlier prototypes of moving vehicles, I was trying to do some stuff with gathering items and I had some diamond teleport pipes and two gone completely lost so two diamonds learned my lesson and i just wanted to show you guys we're only going to be using the pneumatic pipes for the nether crawler if we do have to t you know send something back we can always wait until we're not moving attach it to whatever we need to do attach the motors make the transfer and then take them off before we move again and everything should be fine but as far as static placements it'll all be pneumatic tubes so that's all the testing that I wanted to show you today in the overworld. Now we need to head to the nether and show you what I've been doing there. And here we are in the nether once again. How did we manage that? That was so fast. I wish I could do that all the time. Really? That's... yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, there's a few things that I want to show you. Some things that I've done since the last time we were here. I actually filmed an episode it wound up being 40 minutes to do something very trivial because there was a lot of head scratching and humming and hawing and I said yeah that wasn't very entertaining so to hell with it um, so I redid it and the hangar is now so large that it's taking extra long to load yes I expanded the hangar I pretty much had no choice and I will show you why yeah we have a jetpack on and there are no ghasts in here speaking of ghasts <laughs> Yeah, that's the crap that I have to deal with in here. But that was actually in the uh, machine room downstairs. Or, I guess, directly across from us now. Um, but yeah, I've had ghasts spawn in the hangar. I've had ghasts spawn in the machine room. It's, uh, you know, they're just... They, they don't have any respect at all for what I'm trying to do here. So, this is the engine module. This is what we finished off in the last episode. I've made a couple of changes. One, I've flipped the up and down motors around to make it just a tiny bit more compact um, and I had to redo the wiring as well because once I started messing around with the redstone computers and found out that they have their own 
um, colors associated with certain values in the wiring. It just made sense to make sure that things were in an order that made sense. So I had to change the wiring around. So that's really about all I've done to this guy since then. Um, and then I've added the power plant where we'll be storing all the blue electric power to run the motors. And you can see they're not connected yet because I wanted to keep this guy separate while I was working on it. Um, and you can see it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's a little bit cramped, but it's very, very simple. And the only difficult part I had was trying to get all this stuff in, the retrievers and the pipes and the ender chests that will eventually store the uh, rechargeable blue electric batteries. Um, and make sure everything was attached to a frame. And I'm still not entirely certain if everything is properly attached to a frame, but we're going to find out soon enough. Now I've got, you can see I haven't finished wiring everything yet. Um, these guys are, both of these retrievers are directly adjacent to, or close enough to a blue electric battery that I just needed one block to run that gray cable. So they're connected to blue electric power, but neither of them are connected to a redstone pulse yet and that's what these guys dangling down are going to be for these are the redstone pneumatic tubes that I use they carry the redstone signal as well as whatever items are passing through the tube so it basically serves double duty in the space of one block and then these guys are just dangling until I figure out how I'm going to run the cable that will connect them all but that's basically um, all I have left to do in here in terms of getting it up and running and ready to do everything that it needs to be doing now I just, I'm not the least bit confident that this guy is properly set up, but there's only one way to find out. So what we need to do is I want to, first of all, I want to get rid of these three blocks. Now you can see I've sort of set it up. So this is the gray cable, the blue alloy cable that's going to be carrying the blue electric power to all the different motors. And it's set up now so that when these two modules come together, this will connect to that battery and then these two batteries are connected to that battery and all the batteries in the rows are next to each other. So just that one connection there will allow all of the blue electric power for the motors to come from all of the batteries. So it's hopefully uh, reasonably effective. Now what I, like I say, what I need to do is I want to get rid of these three frames, but I need to still be able to move the, um, the module with the motors so I have to kind of think about exactly, first of all, I need to know what color wire is going to move the motor that's going to send it that way. That way is south, and that means uh, yellow. The yellow wire is going to be the one that we want to use. So now we need to find the yellow wire <laughs> and just double check, make sure we know what side it's on. Once it's connected to the computer and all the wiring is done, it'll be a lot easier. So there's the yellow wire and it's going out the other side. So that's what we need to know because we aren't going to be able to keep everything connected as we might like. So there, now we'll get the switch off. Up. Panel, panel, frame, frame, frame. Yeah, I am pretty anal retentive about picking these things up. So you can see it's a much, much larger hanger. In fact, those two blocks up in the ceiling are what's left of what was originally the end wall for the hanger the last time you saw it. And you can see basically the power plant for the engines was very, very close to the end wall. That's why I decided it's time to expand it. No, absolutely we will not be using up the entire hangar for this project but a little bit more room around to work and kind of play with different layouts and configurations I think was definitely warranted so that's what I've set myself up to do so now we don't need to be doing anything with the cables on this side at the moment so we're just gonna break those out of the way completely and then we need our bloated bag of tricks yellow cable and that switch is in my main inventory. So yellow. Now cross your fingers. I know this thing will move up and down. I've tested it thoroughly, but the forward and back is untested. No dice. It broke. So now we got to figure out what the hell we did wrong. A 
All right, so today we learned a lot of things. We learned that battery boxes without charge don't help motors, and we learned that sometimes, even if you think you've got all the frames connected, you don't. So that was about 45 minutes to get this sorted, and in the process of doing so, I was basically forced to cut off access to the power plant from this side temporarily. I'm going to tweak it and see if I can't reopen it. It's not like the engine area is designed to be moving around through it anyways. It's more or less designed to just be there and once everything is working, don't mess with it. So if I have to leave it like this, eh, I can. It's basically this intersection right here with the pneumatic pipes. If I don't have this frame here connected to some frames below, this intersection block here isn't connected to a frame and it won't move. So I learned that, we got it fixed, we got it working. So now we get to move it to where we can continue working on it. So that's on. We're actually, I pulled out the orange wire and set it to uh, go to this side here, which is the down button, so to speak. And you can see it's flickering, which means it's moving. So that's three, four, five, six. Now let's see where we are. Beauty. See, we can work underneath it now, but we've got lots of room. So I can try and expand it down below here and leave a corridor so that I can run the, uh, like I say, the bundled wires and the ribbon cable all the way up to the front section. We've also moved it forward a little bit already. You saw it was only one or two blocks away from the stairs, and now we've got it forward a little bit, so it'll be much, much easier to work on. I can actually get around top and bottom, whereas before getting up top here basically meant sort of scraping along the ceiling until I found one of these little notched openings here. So that's where we're at. That's what we've done so far. Um, what I need to do, and I'll probably, I won't even worry about making an episode out of it is I have to come back with some dies and code each of these ender chests so that they function as individual chests like if you can see through the the GUI when I pull out my inventory try and keep your eye on the chests and not the GUI see how they're all opening at once is because they're all coded to be basically the same which if I leave it like this you can see I don't have really a ton of storage for batteries. It's a total of 27 um, BT batteries when it takes four batteries to charge one battery box. So if I take four of these and code them differently and fill them all with 27 batteries each, now I've got 108 batteries to work with and I can fully charge all of these battery boxes once I get the retrievers up and running. So. I'll work on that for the next episode. Also, what I want to do in the next episode is I want to finish the power plant. We need to get an M at least one MFSU in place. Um, that will be powering um, the force fields. I want to have some force fields on this guy in various different locations for various strategic reasons. It'll also house a Mark III charging bench so that I can charge my quantum suit, my jet packs, my lap packs, all that other stuff. And I want to set up a similar arrangement to what I've got here, where the power is actually being put into storage devices and then transferred to the ship via ender chest. And that way I can really sort of take advantage of the static generation abilities like maybe, I don't know, a nuclear reactor sometime in the not too distant future. So that's what I plan next is just getting that done. And then really all we'll have left are the TNT bays, yes I said TNT bays, and the front control section and then we can probably finish off the software control scheme and take it out for a test flight. So we've got a few more episodes left and I just wanted to kind of bring you up to speed on exactly what I've been doing. If I end up having to enlarge this hangar we're pretty much screwed so I won't have to waste any time doing that. I'll be able to focus all of my attention on various different testing, finding out exactly what's going to work and if it's interesting I'll record it and put it in an episode for you guys. So I hope you're enjoying the series. If you want to know when I've uploaded another video, the easiest way to do that is to subscribe to my channel. Make sure you let your friends know about my series as well. So thanks for watching and take care, guys.